whoops, all right, let me just stop myself from walking here. Hi, um, so I'm on Google Plus as Marta Stuckel. Uh, my name turned black, so I'm afraid it's not visible on there. Uh, that photo is a, in the background of my title slide, is from the Trinity test, which was the United States test of the first atomic bomb. Uh, the code name for the first atomic bomb was the gadget while the while the project was being built. So um, I'm going to start with my theory of learning. Um, personally, I uh, fo ended up focusing on active constructivism. Uh, so active learning is a theory of pedagogy. It's a way of looking at how should we teach. And the goal is that students should be active participants in the classroom, not simply observers sitting back and listening to a lecture. Um, I teach physics and a little bit of other science, and that active learning theory is very prevalent in science, where we really try to get the kids hands on as much as possible. Um, I also really took to this idea of constructivism, which is a theory of learning, so how we generate new knowledge. And the main principle behind constructivism is that we need to connect new knowledge to experiences and prior knowledge. Um, the trick is, uh, what does this look like for science history and philosophy? There's all these great big ideas that historical events and the, so the role that science played in them can be really fascinating for students to explore. They can really help students to understand certain ideas. Uh, for example, there's aspects of engineering that I can get students to understand by going and physically building something to test a problem. But if we want to look at the human element or the way that engineering plays into the larger society, we usually end up having to look at historical events or current events. And so I would started thinking about how do I get this act of constructivism into those parts of science. And so that kind of led me to um, a general idea for a game. So um, the Manhattan Project was the United States effort to build the first atomic bomb. And it's got all this fascinating history. It's got these really rich connections to science and society, to ethics, um, to engineering challenges. Uh, and it's got all this great stuff to explore. And usually when I've done it, we've explored it by reading or watching a documentary, which is not giving students to the chance to engage in that act of learning. And so I had the idea for a game where the students would actually take the helm of that Manhattan pro of the Manhattan Project and deal with some of the problems that Robert Oppenheimer had to deal with on the way to building that first atomic bomb. Um, so the general structure of the game is a turn-based strategy. There would be a period of initial setup where um, the player is essentially setting everything in motion. Uh, and then the, um, each turn would be based around a progress meeting with some advisors for the project. Uh, so there would be characters within the game who give the players updates um, and then give the players a chance to act on those. Um, I also want to have some random events in between the turns. Uh, in the brain hex categories, this game would be most appealing to the mastermind that wants to be in control of every little thing, every detail. Uh, and I took some inspiration for this from games like Civilization and Warcraft. Um, some of these real classic turn-based strategies where the player has to manage lots of pieces. All right, um, in terms of how you win the game, um, there's going to be a couple of, or there would be a couple of progress bars in the game. Um, so one of those would be for the actual progress on the gadget. Uh, like I said, the gadget was the code name for that first atomic bomb while they were building it. And so as that bar, whoops, uh, so as that bar fills up, it's showing how close are they to having a working bomb. And they win the game when that bar is filled. 
Now, um, one issue that was a major challenge as they were working on the atomic bomb is that the United States weren't the only ones. Uh, Russia and Germany were also working on atomic bombs, and there was a lot of secrecy around the project to try to prevent those other countries from finding out what was going on. And they took some uh, pretty strong measures to try to limit how much uh, the United States enemies would find out. And so I thought it would be interesting to have a suspicion progress bar that essentially as um, Russia or Germany are piecing more together about what's happening with the project, that suspicion bar fills up. And if it gets completely full, then you lose. And I do want to have some randomness in both of those. Um, and that desire to have some ram randomness uh, is what had me initially thinking, uh, envisioning this as a video game. Um, when you're looking at an actual engineering project, especially something on a huge scale, it's not just this steady filling of a tank. Uh, it moves forward in fits and starts, and it, it periodically stalls out and doesn't make any progress for a while. And so I, um, I'd li ideally like to have students to experience some of that by not just having this smooth, continuous progress, uh, but some randomness. All right. Um, another important aspect of these really big engineering projects is managing resources. And this is a really classic feature of turn-based strategy games as well. And kind of the big resources that I identified um, that I want to have students manage are first morale. Uh, so have, have a dial or a gauge to measure how happy the staff of the project are. And then when the morale is at its highest, so when it's in the top third or so of the bar, you get, um, you get faster progress on, the, on building the gadget. Uh, so that bar that um, helps you win the game fills up a little bit faster. The idea is happy people tend to be more efficient. On the other hand, uh, and along with that, there's a low chance of suspicion. Part of how leaks happened during the actual project was people sneaking off base um, and, uh, and talking around or speaking up in local towns, things like that. And if people are happy, if they're committed, they're less likely to be doing things like that. They're maybe less likely to take a paycheck from a Russian spy or something like that. So when you have very high morale, there's a smaller chance of gaining suspicion. And then the converse is when morale is really low, so when the people working on the project are really unhappy, uh, progress is much, much slower, and you've got a much higher chance of um, filling up that suspicion bar. And then the other big resource uh, to manage is going to be a maximum annual budget. Um, you know, there's no such thing as an infinite amount of money, and so the player would have to stay within a certain or stay within a cap on that budget. All right, so um, this kind of initial setup phase where students are, or where the players are setting the stage for what's going to happen. Uh, the very first thing that had to happen was they had to decide where were they going to work on um, constructing, or on building this first atomic bomb. And I want to give the player the chance to make that decision. Um, there were several locations that were actually considered, and I'd want to do some more research to try to include those as much as possible in the, or as options in the game. And I'd want, um, I envision rating them on a couple of different scales. Uh, there would be a cost. Uh, again, there's only so much money for that initial setup, and so there's a limit to how much you can spend on the location. Uh, that was something that was a big factor in the actual Manhattan Project. Um, and then the next uh, rating I've got for the location is isolation. Uh, they wanted somewhere that was pretty far away from other people just to make it difficult for people working there to leak information, to uh, limit the impact of any accidents. Um, and so I decided the way that would be represented in the game is an isolated location would have a much lower chance of gaining suspicion, where um, any locations in more populated places would have a much higher chance of gaining suspicion. Uh, existing infrastructure would also be one of those. Um, essentially, are there roads that could get to the place? Um, if you've got... Uh, 
uh, rail car, or if you've got trains that can go by there, if you've got roads, things like that, uh, runways in place, that's going to tend to increase project or increase the speed of progress since it's easier to get materials there. And then the last one, uh, the best term I could come up with is simply appeal. Uh, how nice of a place is it to live? Um, and that's going to affect morale. If you can get a nice picturesque place or a place with lots of activities for the staff, they're going to tend to be happier. Um, just from what I've read, that was one of the reasons that Los Alamos got picked is... Um, uh, is it was just this beautiful mesa out in the desert. Uh, they could have, they could give people uh, areas where they could have free reign to go hiking or horseback riding, and so being able to keep the people working for the project happy in that location um, would be a consideration. All right, so once the player has picked out a place for their um, for where this is going to be take happening, uh, they need to start building a base. Um, again, stay within that limited budget. There's only so spread out it can be. Um, and each building would need to have some kind of purpose to it. So it needs to be for housing, or it needs to be a lab, or it needs to be for manufacturing. Um, uh, so that they're having to make some decisions about what are buildings for. Um, and one thing you see in a lot of games is they have different tiers of a given building type. And you have to balance between something that's cheap, something that's actually good, and something that's quick to build. Uh, so, for example, um, dormitories are going to tend to be cheaper and quicker to build, but they're maybe not as nice to live in as a small house would be. Uh, I do want to have players able to demolish and build new buildings later, but that kind of thing is always going to come at a cost. And then the last um, kind of initial setup phase is to get people working for the project. And this was something that was really a big challenge with how to manage in the, from what I've read about the actual Manhattan Project. Um, so kind of the way I decided to approach this is each time you extend a job offer to somebody, it gives you a little bit of, of that suspicion. So it fills up that suspicion bar a little bit more. Um, and the people you extend those job offers to may not take it. Uh, there were people who, um, when they got this mysterious offer to go work on a top secret government project, turned it down or there were people who had an idea about what was going on but they turned down the offers to work on the project for ethical reasons um, and so I don't want that to be guaranteed that someone would accept a job. Um, in the actual project they tried to do some spreading out where they took people from. If all of a sudden you go to Berkeley and um, all of the high energy physicists there are suddenly just gone for a top secret government project that gives a lot of information about what's going on. And so the more candidates you take from the same lab, the more suspicion they gain. So the very first person you take from that Berkeley high energy physics lab just gives you a little bit of suspicion. The next person you take gives you a medium amount of suspicion and so on. Uh, and I also want to have um, the player building uh, teams within the larger project. So they build a team to work on the chemistry, they build a team to work on the detonator, uh, they build a team to work on the delivery system, and so that they are uh, selecting candidates to work on the project who have uh, certain specialties um, rather than just general engineers or just general physicists. Um, and then the candidates themselves um, I would want to have them have a couple of ratings. Uh, first one would be how much do they know? And then kind of related to that, their ingenuity or their creativity. Uh, I also want them to have a personality rating. How easy are they to get along with? And then trustworthiness. Um, essentially, someone with a high trustworthiness score would be less likely to um, leak information to the Russians or to uh, talk about the project around town. So they're going to be less likely to raise suspicion. And then a given team, so all of the chemists, for example, would need to have some balance to them. Um, I decided to, uh, the ideal would be to have uh, the 
knowledge and the ingenuity score for the team as the whole to be about equal. Um, if you've got people who all know a lot but aren't very creative, they're not going to be very effective. If you also have people who are really creative but have no clue what they're doing, they're not going to be effective. And so I want to have a mechanic to um, push for a balance with that. Um, I also want to have a penalty if they are putting lots and lots of people with very low personality scores on a team. Uh, if there's just too many people that are hard to work with, that team or that lab shouldn't be an effective one. They, uh, they shouldn't be contributing much to the progress of the gadget. And I also want some uncertainty in those ratings, uh, so some randomness to it. Um, because, uh, to again, get that risk in who are you inviting. Uh, I decided if there's someone who works for the project who already knows the candidate, there's less uncertainty. And that kind of goes back to, um, I mentioned that the more individuals you take from a given lab or from a given site, um, the more suspicion you raise. Well, if you're taking a lot of people from the same lab, you're going to know how accurate those ratings are. Uh, they're going to be pretty on the nose. Um, so there would be some benefit to taking lots of people from the same location, but the player would have to balance that against the suspicion they would gain. So I'm really trying to create a lot of trade-offs in this. All right, um, and I also want to have a mechanic where uh, kind of once they get into those turns, they can release or hire additional personnel as needed. Uh, it's very common in these big projects that you see the needs shifting as time goes on. Um, but each time you release someone, it raises suspicion. Uh, they're back out in the world with a chance to talk all about what they've been doing. And then releasing an entire team raises lots of suspicion. So if all of a sudden all of these uh, detonation specialists that have been who knows where for months are back at their old jobs, that says a lot about the current progress of the project. All right, um, so on a turn when the player's meeting with those advisors, um, I want to have some ongoing issues that they raise, and I want to try to tie that to things that actually happened during the Manhattan Project. Uh, for example, at one point on the project, there was a big baby boom. Uh, basically, when you have lots of people in their 20s and 30s out in the middle of nowhere, they find ways to entertain themselves. Uh, and so this could raise a need to build hospitals or schools. Um, there could be suspected leaks. Um, they had some issues with people working for the project just getting bored and being more inclined to um, get into trouble on base or to wander into town. And um, so I want to create opportunities for the player to respond to those kinds of situations, either change rules um, for the base or add or remove buildings to try to address some of those kinds of issues. Um, I also want to have them get updates on where is each team at this point in the project. Um, so like I said, the overall project would be divided up into smaller teams. Um, and one at each time they have this turn, at least one team would be bumped to a high priority. So there's some kind of technical challenge that team is facing. Uh, everybody else needs them to solve it before real progress can be made on the overall gadget. Um, and so... Uh, you know, or it could be something the team has just hit a much, much bigger hurdle than they ever anticipated they would hit. Something that slows everything down until that's addressed. And so there would be some incentive to really push more resources into that team, get them more personnel or more space. And then at least one team would be low priority. So there's some group that's solved their current problems or they can't really make any progress until someone else has figured out um, how to separate the different isotopes of uranium. So there's just not much they can do at the moment, so they're very low priority. And each team would be shifting between those high, low, and um, medium priorities. And so in response to... Uh, one team needing more resources or one team needing fewer, uh, they could simply shift lab resources. They could say, you know what, the detonation team is in great shape, they're low priority right now, I'm going to take some of their lab space and give it to this other group. Uh, it wouldn't be as effective as a building built for that group they're shifting it to, but it would take less time and money. So again, that idea of trade-offs. Um, 
I want to have the option to shift personnel. So you could take uh, one of your detonation experts and put them on a different team temporarily. They won't be as effective as they were on the detonation team, but you don't have to release them or you don't have to hire someone new. Uh, and then in between turns, I want to have some random events that players would have to respond to immediately. Uh, so those are urgent things, again, that I'd try to tie to the historical events. It could be accidents. Uh, there were a few of those on the project. It could be fires. It could be um, other damage to some kind of structure. Uh, so something that the player has to rebuild or they have to make some emergency shift in the rules uh, for, their, for their personnel. Uh, something that they have to respond to more urgently. So um, with that kind of overview of how I envision the game as a whole looking, um, one of the big questions is, what's next? What do I do with this idea? So I originally envisioned it as a video game. Um, because I, a computer would be able to handle some of that randomness and some of that uncertainty uh, pretty easily without the player having to worry about that aspect. But a board game would be much easier to develop and to deploy. I could even see getting multiplayer, multiple players involved by having one who takes the role of the project director. So they're essentially doing Robert Oppenheimer's job. And then other players are taking on specific teams. So you have one player who's in charge of the team designing the detonator. You have one player who's in charge of coming up with a way to separate uranium. Uh, and the player who's acting as the director allocates resources to the team. And then the other players would be in charge of managing their teams. Um, next year, I'm going to be teaching some chemistry. And I could see um, this having some potential as a live action game uh, to integrate some of that history and some of those science and society type of issues uh, into a unit on nuclear chemistry. Uh, when I've talked about this project with students, I've found it's very, very engaging. And so if I could get um, some degree of playfulness into that, I could see that being even more engaging for students. Uh, so that's an overview of the thinking I've done so far. Um, again, on Google, my project is posted to Google Plus, and um, I think I show up on there as Marta Stuckel Rogers. Um, and I, I guess that's about what I have to say. Um, so any questions, any comments are certainly welcome. <laughs>